Kay is in the backstage, and I think Neil will be back up here in a little bit. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and bring you on up, Davide. Let's do some AV uh, debugging here. Can you see me? Oh, perfect, because I can't see at all the preview, so that's... Oh, I can hear and I can see you. Perfect. Then it actually works. That's nice. All right. Um... Works is good. Works is good. Oh, yeah. And you're here too, Neil. Nice. Yeah. All right. Uh, can you get the slides up? Yep. One second. I will I will do the thingy again. Um, I should turn off notifications here. Yeah, that's a smart plan. Yeah, annoying. Do not and disturb. Hit the download button to pull the PDF and do the things. This next Thank topic you. is going to be a pretty exciting one. I know all of our uh, Apple hardware fans are definitely going to be interested in this one because we're going to be talking about Fedora Asahi Remix, which is the uh, official, unofficial Fedora remix for, yeah. for Mac, I guess. Uh, it's, it's a thing. <laughs> it is an official Fedora remix, that's for sure. Yep, <laughs> it is a very strange state, but that's okay. Awesome. Well, we'll do. A, we'll get the slides up here. No rush, because we are a little bit ahead. Of yeah, uh, I'm just waiting for it to upload. It takes time. Okay, no problem. How has the release party been for both of you? First time on Matrix for an event? It has yeah, been, been interesting. Well. It's been yeah. interesting. Uh, I think uh, I, I didn't really use the, uh, I don't really use the popover widget because it, it causes Element to freak out. So I just, I have a browser tab open with YouTube and, and, and do that way instead. Um, except for obviously this, where I am not doing that because I don't really need to hear myself like in a loop. Yep. Yeah, same for me. I was following the YouTube stream in another tab. Yeah, I think that's one thing that's nice about this approach is that it can be flexible, is that people who are joining from Matrix, you can see it in the popover, just have everything be in, in one spot. Or it's like, even for like when we did the Creative Freedom Summit, that's how I did it. It was like I mm -hmm. had, one, had it over on YouTube, and then I just used Matrix just for the chat. Yeah, so uh, the slides have been uploaded. They should oh, be a yep. thing now. That is that is on yeah. me. And I think both of us, Davida, do you have the ability to, to see the controls or is it just me? I see the slides, but I see no controls. Okay, so I guess I'm just doing the controls. You, you can do the, the advancing and then we'll work it out. Yep. Uh, oh, all right. right. Uh, so we're about eight minutes early, but I think we can go ahead and get started since y'all are the last one up here. Uh, so it also gives you a little bit of extra time for Q&A as well at the sure. end. All right. That works. With that, I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to both of you to talk about Fedora Asahi Remix for our last release. Take it away. Cool. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Davide. And I'm Neil. Uh, we'll be talking about uh, what's been happening in Fedora Asahi and the recent release of Fedora Asahi Remix 40. Right. So uh, I, here's us. We do <laughs> lots of things. The bullet points, as you have joked before, David, the bullet points have gotten longer. Uh, yeah, there is no need to read through this. Yeah, we're not reading it. You can look at it later. Who cares? Uh, so starting with Fedora Asahi. Um, so this starts with the Fedora Asahi Special Interest Group, which packages and maintains the software used to support Apple Silicon platforms on Fedora Linux. So we develop and maintain uh, variants of Fedora Media for Apple Silicon platforms. Uh, this primarily in, is the Fedora Asahi Remix. It's a special derivative of Fedora Linux optimized around Apple Silicon. Um, we provide a custom kernel as well as uh, Mesa and bootloader code, along with the obvious branding changes. Um, the Remix comes in KDE, GNOME, Server, and Minimal flavors. Our flagship is the KDE flavor. So where we are today. And... Um... Yeah, now let's talk about what's the current state. So with the latest release, uh, you can run Fedora Asahi Remix on pretty much all released Apple Silicon hardware with M1 and M2 processors. So all M1 and M2 laptops and desktops on the market, except the Mac Pro, um, mostly because almost nobody has the Mac Pro. So that hasn't really been a priority so far. Uh, all of these systems are running um, now on the latest firmware, which is 13.5. And firmware in this context is the version of macOS 
that the machine runs on the other side because we treat MacOS as kind of the stable interface uh, to the hardware. And MacOS also provides a bunch of firm, actual firmware that then is used to do platform enablement. Um, we have hardware accelerated graphics by default, uh, which we'll talk about in a second. We have full support for the camera and for the little touch bar screen thing that some of the laptops have. Um, the task bar is actually quite funny because it shows up on the Linux side as its own frame buffer. So we have a small demon in Rust that gives you function keys on it, which is what we'd expect most people would want for it. We have full support for speakers, um, and we'll talk about speakers in a sec as well, uh, with the exception of the iMac, uh, because the iMac is slightly weird in that regard, and that hasn't gotten to the top of the pile just yet. Uh, and we have HDMI video output for machines with physical HDMI ports. Um, so if you have a laptop or a desktop with a physical HDMI port, you can use video out through that. Um, next slide, please. Uh, of the things that are not supported yet, so I mentioned video out. Uh, one thing that isn't supported yet that I know is something that a lot of people are looking forward to is support for display port alt mode, which will allow us to do video out uh, from the USB-C ports. So some of the, some of the MacBooks, especially some of the smaller laptops, only have USB-C out, they don't have HDMI out. So right now, there's not really a good way to do video out from those specific models. Um, this is work in progress. It will likely release later in the year. Um, other things that are actively worked on, HDMI audio support is mostly there, but it's not quite stable yet. So we've disabled it in the release so far. Um, the microphone isn't supported yet. There was preliminary work done to get the microphone going, but it's just not there yet. Um, and finally, we don't yet support the secure element and the touch ID. Um, the secure element is a hardware thing that these machines have that allows you, among other things, to implement a TPM on top of it. We know how this can be supported, but it's just not been done yet. Um, next slide. Yep. Come on. Um, there we go. Thank you. Uh, now, speaking about the audio, these machines are actually quite interesting from an audio standpoint. Uh, they ship uh, with a very nice setup. Uh, on the Mac side, they use a lot of software to provide a good audio experience. And we we built kind of a similar setup to provide an equivalently or ideally a better experience on the Linux side. So we have a daemon that takes care of making sure that the speakers don't get overdriven. Uh, because on these machines, if you just like blindly play audio through the speakers without any checks, you can like easily burn them out if you play too high of a volume. So we have a daemon that checks that the speakers are always in a safe state and cuts off the audio if that's a problem. We have another demo that uses fancy psychoacoustics to provide bass. So even if the laptops only have to like tiny tweeters, they're able to give you a really good, like perceptually good bass experience, which is something that's really cool that I'm not aware of any other laptops on the market being able to do this on Linux. Um, and finally, we have a DSP chain. All of these are the, the best stuff in particular is implemented as a DSP as part of Pipewire and Wireplumber. And this is all this is all optimized in the audio stack on Linux, so it just works out of the box. And while this is specific to us right now, the same techniques and the same tools could be used to enable other laptops if someone wanted to. Uh, right, slide. right. And so, you know, on top of having all this stuff with the with the hardware enablement, uh, the base layer, as well as the sound stuff, obviously the most exciting thing that anybody wants to see is the graphics. And so the really cool thing about Fedora Asahi is that we have the first conformant OpenGL 4.6 implementation. We've got full support for things like Blender and games, and the performance is raw, is amazing. It's basically at the same level, and in many cases, way better than what macOS offers with their somewhat lackluster OpenGL implementation. Uh, I can say that because I was a game dev, and I did do this and had to deal with <laughs> macOS OpenGL. I like our implementation way better. Um, Right. And on top of that, we have, of course, with the Fedora Asahi Remix 40 release, we are now using KDE Plasma 6 for our KDE variants experience. I went through a bunch talking about this earlier in the KDE Plasma talk, so I'm not going to go over that again. But again, the, the main things to keep in mind is it's a refinement of what you've had before with KDE Plasma 5. Uh, there's no right super big surprises, but there's just little bits and pieces of enablement smoothness and just an overall better experience um, as a Wayland desktop. And there's more details in the Fedora magazine. You can go check this out. There's lots of things you can look up for this. So with the, you know, as I just said, we released Fedora Sahi Remix 40 um, earlier this month. 
Uh, so you can get it now. It's all there. All this stuff that we just said is all there. You can go and have fun with it. So what's coming next? So we are starting through the efforts. We're restarting our efforts to work through our patches to get them upstreamed into the various uh, projects, the kernel, U-Boot, and Mesa. I think we recently had a reroll of the Mesa patches, and they're included in 24.1. Um, although, again, you can't really use the upstream Mesa Asahi driver just yet because the kernel parts aren't stabilized and not upgraded, integrated upstream. Once those are done, then the, the Mesa parts will also be stabilized and it will work. That's going to take some time. Um, that's being driven by Hector Martin and Alyssa Rosenzweig, as well as Asahi Lina. And then the U-Boot stuff is being driven by Mark Katenis. Sorry if I said that name wrong. But yeah, uh, Mark from OpenBSD uh, actually does the U-Boot work. And there, that's been rolling through actually fairly quickly. So we're, we're going through that um, currently. So... And on the Fedora side, we've also been working uh, to try to get as much as possible of the enablement into Fedora proper. We want the remix to effectively be as small as it can be, because ultimately the goal that we would like to reach eventually is to have full support for this hardware in Fedora itself. Um, so right now, the approach we've been taking is that whenever there's a package that's needed for hardware enablement, if we can, we will package it in Fedora itself. And right now, we have about 25 or so packages that we maintain as the SI SIG in Fedora. And then uh, for packages that are specific to the remix, so things around branding, for example, we package those in copper. And we also package in copper the packages that Neil just mentioned, so U-Boot, Meza, and the kernel. Um, we could probably uh, get most of the U-Boot patches into the Fedora package if we wanted to, but it's, it's still a pretty heavy patch set, so I don't think it's worthwhile until more of that is upstream. Um, likewise, for the kernel and Mesa, because they are somewhat tightly coupled until the driver uh, is is further along and in the upstreaming status, it makes sense to have those maintained on our end, so it's easier to give platform enablement support to the users more quickly. Um, but all of these, you can look them up in our cover if you want. The kernel is tracked. Uh, Neil does most of the kernel enablement work and is tracked from the Arc kernel, uh, and it's just what well, little things are needed for this hardware on top of Arc. There's no additions beyond that. Next slide, please. Uh, the other thing we've been working recently has been uh, being able to build the installer for the system in Fedora infrastructure. So the way SI is installed is that you run an installer on macOS, and the installer is a little shell script that you effectively curl pipe bash, and then that downloads the installer itself, which is a Python program, and the installer then gets, repartitions the machine, lays out the image on disk, and then reboots the machine in a special state where it can actually uh, replace the kernel for the new system with the with Bini, which is the bootloader, and then your system is set up. Now, right now, we've been using the installer that's provided by the SI Linux project, but we wanted to be able to build this in Fedora, uh, both so we could build the first stage bootloader and so that we could build the installer, uh, because one of the requirements for having this in Fedora proper is being able to build all the components in Fedora. So right now, we are building the first stage bootloader in Fedora, though it's not used yet. And there's a PR app to also build the installer. Uh, that required an exception uh, from FASCO because the installer, as I mentioned, uses Python, but it uses Python on macOS. So we will need to be able to build Python for macOS, um, which turns out is really hard because there isn't really a free tool chain available for building uh, macOS targets from Linux. Uh, there is a tool chain that can be found, but it relies on bits of Xcode that aren't really redistributable. So it's not really a thing we can do just yet, uh, but it is something we're keeping an eye on in the future. We would like to have a fully free tool chain that we can use to build this entire thing from Fedora. Uh, next slide. And uh, that's all we had in content. I think we went a lot faster than we thought we would. Uh, you can find the references to all of, uh, all of the things we talked about. Uh, the link to the remix, which has the instructions for how to install it. The documentation that we have uh, the documentation also includes uh, a page we just wrote recently to it that explains uh, what are all the things in which the remix is different from Fedora itself, uh, which was prompted by people asking how they could build something like this for other use cases. Uh, so we will probably try to put together some documentation as well on how the remix was built in the first place. So hopefully other folks can like save some time and not have do all of the missteps we did throughout this. And then the issue tracker, the mailing list, uh, we have a um, tag on this course, and we have a matrix room. 
Right. And on top of that, like when uh, if you can't contribute in the terms of code or whatever, and you want to help support the work that we're doing, you can sponsor us on GitHub Sponsors. Uh, Hector Martin uh, manages the Asahi Linux Upstream project. You can sponsor him there. And then, of course, myself, I have GitHub Sponsors for the Fedora Asahi Remix as the Asahi SIG lead and the developer of the distribution. Um, you can see more information about this kind of stuff on their website. And uh, there's even more people that are involved in this, and their links are also available, you know, if you want to support the efforts that they're working on. I mean, we'd love you to, to come in and help us either through code and documentation and, and, and testing, or also financially to help us, you know, buy computers that we need to actually make this work. Because as it turns out, this ain't cheap. <laughs> yes, so many laptops. <laughs> All right, I think that's all we had, and we'd be happy to answer any questions. All right, thank you. We already do have a few. We've got, looks like, five questions so far. Oh, right. am I video? Oh, am I visible? You're, you are you can see you. Yes. We can see you. Okay, I can't see myself, so I will just take your word for it. Well. We will go ahead and get started with our questions here. For folks who are watching along live, you can look in the chat to find the thread that just got bumped uh, to uh, raise your questions. We'll go, looks like we have one that's top voted here, which is our first question is, why is this a remix and not a spin or a lab? So the reason for this is that the rules for a remix versus something that is a spin come down to everything has to be built in Fedora Koji to be a spin or a lab. If it is built, if any component is built outside of Fedora Koji, then it has to be a remix. Since we use copper to build the kernel, uh, Mesa and U-boot parts, as well as we use stuff in the AWS to build uh, the images and host the website uh, outside of Fedora infrastructure and outside of the Fedora accounts, um, we don't qualify to be a, a, a spin. Um, even though all the stack is open source and everything's available, um, the various rules within Fedora around, for example, you can only have one kernel package, no ups, no non-upstream patches, uh, supporting multiple mesas inside the in there, and all these other things, makes it very complicated to offer this um, within Fedora itself. So it is a remix that exists a little bit outside, with as much of stuff in the project as possible, and I mean, it's effectively, it effectively operates as a spin with the minor exception of packages coming from copper for some bits and pieces. Um, it is it is run by the Fedora Sahi SIG. It follows the Fedora cadence. While we are not 100% in lockstep, and that's mostly because it's it's very hard when you don't have release engineering tooling doing it for you automatically. Um, we are very, very close to the Fedora release cycles. Like we only, we released... Fedora Asahi Remix 40, I think it was two weeks after yeah. Fedora Linux 40. Like, and it was only two weeks because we were both traveling and we couldn't actually get it done. Uh, yeah, uh, we had daily builds going already, but we wanted to actually test them before unleashing them onto the world. Right. So in, in some respects, we do things a little bit differently from Fedora that are good. And in some respects, we do things a little bit differently from Fedora that kind of aren't as great as they could be. Uh, and this is where the the remix part kind of comes into play. Like we are outside of Fedora infrastructure for some stuff, uh, or at least Fedora Koji. And so some of the things, we, because of that, we just can't be a spin. And I think the long-term goal is that we don't need to be a spin for the a, a distinct spin. Um, ideally, once more of these components are up and we've got, you know, get things wired up into Pungy and whatever, we can do things like produce an installer, the installer apparatus through Fedora infrastructure and allow um, Fedora, for example, Fedora KDE from, that is built for ARM to just be installed on an Apple Silicon Mac. It's going to be a while before we get there, um, but that is the long-term goal. And the, the, the remix will continue to exist for the foreseeable future to be able to handle fast-tracking new enablement work and, and getting things done. But like the long-term goal is the remix will be a fast track and the, the main distribution will be the slow track for some definitions of fast and slow. All right. 
Next up on the queue, we have, looks like our next voted upvoted question is question three, uh, which is what if that sound demon dies? Can you burn out the speakers then? No, no. the audio system so shuts down. That, there is protection on the kernel side, yes. That will uh, effectively, what the demon does is that he keeps poking at a watchdog on the kernel side, and when he stops poking, then the speakers get cut off. Yeah. Um, we we automatically like so the speak the speaker demon actually is invoked by Udev. Uh, again, this is some some gnarly bits here. The speaker demon is invoked by Udev. If if the demon is no longer able to run or it crashes or whatever, and Udev can't start it, then the kernel will immediately just stop offering the speakers. They will just do nothing. So you you can't use the speakers without the demon running. Yeah, there was a lot of work done to make sure this would be safe for users because we really didn't want to have people to then have to show up to the Apple store with like burned out tweeters. Uh, so Computer far, schedule. I think only one machine was lost during development. Uh, and that was and on that purpose. That was done basically on purpose when Marcan was testing this. Yeah. So we're generally OK uh, on that front. Like you, it, There was a lot of effort to make sure that 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 the audio didn't work if the daemon was not monitoring the speakers. Makes sense. Well, there's another sound question related to that. It looks like from here, all the questions either one or two votes. So we'll just go in sequential order. So going back to question number two about microphone support, is the missing support just for the built-in microphone or for any peripheral microphone as well? It's just the built-in one. Uh, and the reason it's missing is because the built-in microphone on Apple Silicon uh, runs off a coprocessor that uses uh, its own special firmware and it runs off a custom processor with its own custom ISA. So there was a whole lot of reverse engineering that happened around understanding like how that thing works in the first place and that is done. And now the part that it's doing is the actually taking all those learnings and integrating them into a driver that can be used from Linux. Yeah. Uh, as it turns out, Apple does a lot of just strange ASICs and custom uh, application and operating system software for all the and for to to manage all the peripherals. And so that is that means that essentially we're writing programs that talk to systems instead of dumb devices. And so that makes a lot of this very, very complicated. I mean, it's the same reason why we don't have Thunderbolt and USB. We don't have Thunderbolt USB four support. Like the controller is custom, the interfaces are custom. It's it's a bunch of reverse engineering work to plug all these things back together. As someone who was uh, part of the Apple ecosystem before I went to the Linux side, that's very relatable. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I remember my, my first time trying to do it was on. I had it was Fedora twenty. And I had an, a 2007 iMac desktop that had some NVIDIA discrete card, and I could just get a headless Fedora. That was all I could get. So anyways, yeah, that just definitely, that resonated with me, my old teenage self hacking on trying to trying to get Fedora on my iMac. Uh, we'll go move forward with the next question here to, looks like question, well, question five has gotten a few upvotes. Uh, does installing Asahi void the MacBook warranty? No, because... Um, the, well, one, it, uh, I, I guess, I don't know about outside of the United States, but at least in the United States, it does not. Um, it, you're not allowed to do that. There, there are various reasons why that's not allowed, but, um, for all practical purposes, the way that the software is installed, the, the Fedora Linux distribution is installed is it's always side by side to Mac OS. Um, and one of the other things we do is we just don't generally allow removing Mac OS from the system. Um, and because you need Mac OS to update the firmware, you need Mac OS to actually manage your Asahi installations. Uh, and also you need Mac OS to boot Asahi in the first. There's a lot of well, Mac OS. Well, you need another Mac OS to boot Asahi. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a lot yeah. of Mac OS involved, but like the important thing is um, we don't actually support removing Mac OS from the system. And because we don't support removing Mac OS from the system, your system is effectively always in a supportable state from an Apple support perspective. Uh, it's also worth saying that the way these machines are built, uh, if you if you entirely wipe the drive and if you wipe like the or even if you wipe the, the firmware of the NAR memories on it, 
the machine is still recoverable. Like it will look like it's dead, but you can use another, either a Linux machine with iDevice Restore or another Mac uh, with Apple Configurator uh, from MacOS, and it will restore it to factory and come back to life. Um, as far as we're aware, it is not possible to break these machines uh, in any way, because I think it even restores all of the internal memories. So there, I, I think the old, I think there's theoretically a couple of cases, but they're really hard to hit. Yeah. All right. Well, our next upvoted question is, uh, well, it looks like a few are actually rising to the top here, but looks like our next one, where did it go? Uh, oh, okay. Well, this one, is there any tech, are there any tech choices you made early on that you would change now? Uh, no, cause I think we changed a lot of our tech choices yeah. early on as part of figuring it out. <laughs> like the, the very, so I, I, I've alluded to this before in other, in other venues, but like the first releases of Fedora Asahi Remix for Apple Silicon, uh, you know, they were based on Fedora 36 and they were jerry-rigged by Dabda and I with like very, very crappy things. And like, I had to go visit him in person and we had to sit down together to actually get it installed on the computer. Um, it was, it was not fun. We, we very quickly, a lot of the early choices were let's try to get this working and then let's try to figure out how to get it running and stable. And over the course of 37 through 39, we practically redid almost everything that we did for that. Like there is very little of Asahi Remix 40 that actually was part of the very beginning of Fedora Asahi Remix because, uh, a lot changed. A lot changed in the in the time frame of bringing things up. Uh, one thing I would say that made a big difference was uh, initially, as Neil was saying, we're doing builds manually, which is terrible. Uh, both because like I don't really want to ship to users builds I like artisanally crafted on my machine, and also it's a lot of work. So uh, we spent quite a bit of work putting together an actual infrastructure that we could use to do automated builds. So we have this whole thing in AWS right now that does builds every day, and then it pushes them in a way so they can be immediately tested, and then we have a way to promote them to release and all of that. And that was fun, because on one end, I had no idea how to do anything in AWS, so I got to learn that. Um, and like we were lucky that we could use the Graviton workers there to do builds, because we, for various reasons, we need to do builds on ARM machines. Um, so it was, uh, it was very useful to be able to use those and be able to do the builds there. Another fortuitous choice was our usage of the Kiwi image build tool, because um, unlike all the other options that we had at Fedora at the time, uh, the Kiwi image build tool could be actually run from pretty much any machine, whether it was locally in, a, in an emulated environment. It, it, in the very, very first builds that I was doing, I was doing them on the, the package test runner ARM machines that we have uh, in, in, in Fedora <laughs> infrastructure. Um, but, uh, because it was a super lightweight and very flexible tool, um, it was very easy for us to produce the images in a way that was repeatable. And, and that was incredibly important for David and I to be able to like troubleshoot and, and fix things and iterate on it and eventually automate it so that we could just have these builds. Like we have builds with logs and, and, and um, uh, bill of materials information and things like that, that allow us to like be able to check what changed from build to build very easily if we want to. And that is a great segue to remind that our first talk and the release party tomorrow at 10 a.m. U.S. Eastern, 1400 UTC, is by David Duncan talking exactly about the Kiwi build system. Uh, so you can get a deeper dive on all of those things in our first session of the day tomorrow. Um, I know we are getting close to, well, kind of. We got 10 minutes. We got plenty of time. <laughs> but the questions keep coming. We've got 10 questions for the session. We're like just at half. Oh, wow. Uh, so next one that looks like the most upvoted is how suitable or safe is Asahi Remix for non-nerds or non-technical people? Safe in terms of not breaking anything. Uh, okay. Um, 
Your mileage may vary. Uh, I think it really depends on what you're trying to do. So like even me as a technical person, I don't currently daily drive um, Fedora Sahi Remix, even though I have I have an Apple Silicon Mac that I do the development on. I don't daily drive that Mac because um, I kind of need the Thunderbolt port to work. Uh, that is not having the Thunderbolt port is a is a big problem because my current setup involves me plugging into Thunderbolt to a hub that connects me to my USB KV to, that connects me to my KVM that allows me to sit here and do stuff. Um, since that all doesn't work, that's a problem. So I think if you if the the missing hardware enablement isn't an issue for you, it's just like any other Fedora system. I mean, like I. It, it it's fine and it's actually pretty difficult to permanently break it i mean like you can break it as much as any other linux system but like you can't break the mac itself the yeah. worst case scenario is that you just re you just reinvoke the installation process and go go about your day um uh, for what is worth i i use the mac studio as my like daily work machine uh and it, it works fine for that uh, one thing i would say to be aware is if you use a lot of software from flatpak most things on Flatpak for AR64 are not in good shape. Uh, they'll either not work uh, or they won't exist at all. And there's an added complication for this platform that because we use a custom Mesa driver, you need a special Flatpak runtime for things that use hardware acceleration to work at all. So uh, I would say if you primarily consume content from RPMs, this is going to be a good experience. If you primarily consume content from Flatpak, it will require some fiddling. Uh, and I personally just avoid Flatpak on this platform because um, I mostly just use it for Element and I can run Element in a browser and it mostly works. I mean, in general, I would probably say that Flatpaks on ARM aren't in good shape in the first place. Yep. That, that's a, like that's independent of the Asahi stuff, but like Flatpaks outside of x86-64 are in a very sad state of affairs outside of Fedora Flatpaks. And for Fedora flat packs, while multi arch is actually fairly good because we build it for all the architectures we have, um, the the driver thing comes up. And again, because yeah. we don't have we don't have the Asahi Mesa driver enabled in uh, Fedora's upstream Mesa, uh, we don't have we don't have that in in our in our flat pack runtime. And it won't work anyway if you turn it on because it would be missing the U. It'll be missing the critical commit that actually makes it work, which is intentionally <laughs> not there, so that you don't accidentally do something bad to your hardware. So, yeah. Excellent. Let's see. We have uh, one, two, three, four questions left. Let's go to this next one. Actually, this one I think you already answered, but I'll give you just a chance if you want to add anything on this specifically. Um, when everything works, microphone, et cetera, with Fedora, will the install script have the option to let us remove Mac OS completely? Uh, no, we, we are, I don't we, think so. Yeah. We have, uh, no, I think... we have no plans to do it because of the simple reason that the, Mac OS is the only way to get firmware updates. Um, so the, the one way we could do that, which I know has been talked about, but is is not there at all. And it hasn't been started is the reason you need Mac OS is because, uh, the macOS installation as kind of a special place in the firmware, and it allows you to authenticate to the firmware of the machine and manage it to simplify things. There is a way to also have a Linux install take that place, but that requires having the secure element working first, and then it requires wiring up all of this stuff. Uh, so that's probably, I would say, a year plus away uh, if, and if someone ends up actually doing it, which is unclear because um, I mean, macOS doesn't take that much space on disk in the first place, so it's not it's not that much of a burden having it. You don't have to boot it. You don't even see it because the machine would just boot Linux by default. So mm, makes sense. I thought that'd be a quick one. Uh, this one's gotten a few uh, votes uh, from Secure Root. Are you seeing Asahi being the future base for new ARM-based Windows laptops as well? <sighs> uh, that's an interesting question. I think. If somebody wanted to make a remix to support a specific other ARM platform or another hardware platform, I think they could probably use some of the lessons we learned here or some of the tooling we made for that. Uh, I don't think Asai itself would be 
terribly useful for that because the hardware is going to be very different. Like the, the thing about ARM is most of these machines are much closer to an embedded system or a cell phone than like a standard PC that you can think of. So there is a lot of custom components that require magical special handling. Like if, if any of you has played with the X13S, for example, that Lenovo has, uh, that is an interesting device and it requires a lot of fiddling to get it working on Linux. And it's a lot of entirely different fiddling than the one that's required here. So um, I don't know, it would be interesting to see. I know there's more ARM stuff that's supposed to come out on the market soon. So we'll see, we'll see how that goes. I mean, for what it's worth, we do have the Fedora Kiwi descriptions upstream repo, where which was actually forked from the Fedora Asahi Kiwi uh, descriptions in the first place. So um, if there was more interest in producing those kinds of things from a Fedora Linux perspective, that's always a good starting point. And I know David and I um, in Fedora Cloud were happy to take contributions in that respect to enable that kind of stuff um, with the Fedora Kiwi descriptions. But I will also point out that, uh, you know, on top of what David has said about how these platforms are all weird. Um, you know, we, we're talking about Windows on ARM platforms. And the thing that's kind of awkward about Windows on ARM that we don't really acknowledge too much is that um, Windows gets the benefit of being able to use UEFI and ACPI and be able to auto discover the hardware platform and boot up and, and work properly. Um, no one's trying to do the same, use those same interfaces to boot Fedora Linux on those platforms. And because of that, like, so for example, the X13S that David mentioned is a Windows on ARM device. For Windows, it boots through UEFI and ACPI. For Linux, it uses device tree and has to be done through UBoot and, and, and then have emulated UEFI from that instead of using the UEFI that already exists on the device itself. So like one of the problems that we're gonna see longer uh, across the board with these Windows on ARM devices is that Linux cannot take advantage of any of the enablement that Windows does. And because we can't take advantage of any enablement, we have to start over basically from scratch for all of them. And that makes it considerably more difficult to support than it would be if we could reuse the same interfaces that Windows uses, like what OpenBSD does and other operating systems do when they're trying to boot on these things. Um, look, at, you know, if anyone's interested, there's a there was a blog post a few years ago by a guy who was working on trying to put Linux on um, the Windows on ARM dev box that Microsoft released a few years ago. And they outlined some of the problems of even being able to get Linux on it and ultimately gave up because it, it didn't work. It couldn't be made to work. Um, there's a lot of challenges for making Windows on ARM devices useful for Linux. Um, I am cautiously optimistic something will happen here, but I don't really know. All right, so three minutes left and two questions. I think we can do it. Uh, this one is uh, why uh, curl pipe bash as installation <laughs> method? It's promoting. <laughs> oh my okay. gosh. So uh, you have to install the OS on the machine. You have to get the installer on the machine. So one option is you can download the shell script and run it. Uh, but at that point, you're downloading the shell script from an HTTPS website. You might as well just do curl pipe bash because you have to trust the source. Like it's trust on first use effectively. Um, now, one thing we could do that would make this better is if we ship the installer instead of uh, a Python thing that is used from a shell script, if we ship it as an actual macOS app. And then that that is a and like a package that gets notarized by Apple and it shows up with like a nice icon and everything. And now, it has a graphical interface that, and fanciness. Yeah, the problem with doing that is twofold. One, it costs money. And two, uh, I don't think anybody here particularly enjoys or wants to do Objective C development in Xcode. Oh, to no. Do that. Like, if somebody I'm... from the community wanted to do that, but by all means, it would be more than welcome. Um, we could write a Qt application and then wrap it up and bundle it like we do with Fedora Media Writer. But again, it comes down to how much time do we want to do, can we spend on it? Right now, it's, I mean, it's on our list. It's something we want to deal with. But yeah. like, we have this long pile of things that are like, way more important to deal with right now. So that that's pretty much why. Well, and of course, as soon as I've said last question, I've gotten three more questions. So you will have to take a look at the uh, matrix thread after we finish. Sure. But let's go ahead and wrap up with this one that came in earlier. Uh, this one from Roland. Is this work planned for upstreaming the Linux kernel or other relevant projects as a whole in the future? Yes. 
Oh, that, yes. that is the goal. The, the goal of the Asai Linux project is to get everything upstream. And getting everything upstream takes time and effort. Uh, I think we have a good path for upstreaming for U-Boot. There is mostly a matter of actually getting all the patches up. For the kernel, there are some areas that require fairly significant design work with the kernel, the wider kernel community to figure out what a, like sometimes there's kind of an impetus mismatch between the subsystem in the kernel does something and the way this platform does it. So we have to figure out a way to redesign the subsystem to support this platform well, but also support everything else and do this in a way that's acceptable for the wider kernel community. And that is a lot of work. Uh, so we'll get there, but it, it will be a while. Um, there's a, I'll drop the link in the chat after this, but there's a link with a like table of everything and whether it's upstream or not, what the state is at and all, and where the patches are. Excellent. Well, that brings us right to the end of the of the slot. Thank you, Davide and Neil, for your overview and the detailed Q&A on all things Asahi Linux and trying to stubbornly find ways to put Linux on Apple hardware. I Thank you. It. Thanks for being a part of the party. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.